from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Rare Book and Special Collections Division. Uh, today we have a real treat. Those of you who came by oh, about a year and a half ago now, isn't it, uh, had the treat of listening to uh, Bill and Sylvia Peterson talk about searching for a famous book, The Census of the Kelmscott Chaucer. They were celebrating their publication of the census of uh, that famous work. And today uh, we have Bill back again because he's prolific and has another book to celebrate, and we're very glad to be able to help with that. Uh, today we're talking, uh, Bill will be talking about and introducing us, I suspect in many cases, to Ethel Reed, a uh, woman born in Massachusetts in uh, 1874, is that correct? Uh, and uh, 21 years later found herself considered to be the leading uh, woman graphic artist in America. Uh, a quick voyage to Europe and a couple of years go by and she literally vanishes in the fog, which is the topic of uh, the talk today. It's to celebrate the publication of Bill's new book, The Beautiful Poster Lady, um, A Life of Ethel Reed, which among other things tries to fill in the gaps of what happened after Ethel Reed disappeared from uh, public knowledge. Uh, we have, as always, we have the opportunity to look at some original materials afterwards. I'm very grateful, first of all, to the staff of Princeton Photographs, uh, who came through like champs uh, with several posters and photographs for us to look at. We do have one book from the Rare Book Collection, and then Mark Samuel Lasner uh, brought by both a book from the University of Delaware Libraries for you to look at, and a poster from his own spectacular private collection. So this is an opportunity for us to um, spend some time afterwards. Um, those of you who've been coming know that we try to keep these talks uh, moving at a regular clip. I welcome suggestions from people or if they're book artists in the room that feel they would like uh, to have an opportunity to talk about their work or others, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm very pleased to have uh, Bill Peterson come and talk to us about Ethel Reed today. Bill Peterson. Thank you very much. Uh, since you understand by now that this is in fact a sustained infomercial, um, <laughs> I would like to give you the URL of a blog that I've just created within the last uh, week or two devoted to Ethel Reed. It's uh, Ethel Reed, one word, dot wordpress dot com. And what I'm trying to do there is to put on the blog um, every image that I can find of, of, of her work or every image of her. And it's not complete yet, it's still a work in progress, but, but I'm, I've made a good start. And the book itself, of course, is over there with, with order forms. So. <laughs> um, Ethel Reed has the reputation of being one of the most mysterious and enigmatic figures in the history of American graphic design. In the 1890s, she achieved international fame as a poster artist in Boston while still in her early 20s. Did a remarkable series of posters and book illustrations, many of which you can see over there, during a span of less than two years, and then sailed to Europe and disappeared completely from view after the turn of the century. So what became of her? Nobody has ever been able to trace her beyond that point. I've always thought that the most interesting people are the people with secrets. And here was a secret on a grand scale. A distinguished young artist who rather, like Amelia Earhart, simply became invisible to human eyes at a certain point. Or as she herself put it, vanished in the fog. This felt to me like an irresistible challenge. Could I find Ethel Reed? Could I recover her hidden life? So I decided to write a biography of her. What I came to realize almost immediately is, was that she was famous during her lifetime as one of the great beauties of the age, and that she was, in effect, a 19th century media celebrity. Glamorous photographs of her, an endless 
gossipy chit-chat appeared regularly in newspapers and magazines across America. And what I found even more fascinating, there was evidence that she played an active role in manipulating and promoting this image. She was indisputably famous and was skillfully manipulating that fame in the background on all this long before Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> it's alarming to think what she could have done with the aid of our modern social media. <laughs> but to start at the beginning, Ethel Reed was born in Newburyport, Massachusetts in 1874. Uh, the daughter of a local photographer and an Irish-American mother. Edgar Reed, her father, seems to have been spectacularly unsuccessful professionally. <laughs> uh, and when he died of tuberculosis in early middle age, he left behind a huge pile of debts. Ethel Reed experienced a childhood of alarming poverty which she always attempted to conceal in her later years. Uh, I've come to believe, in fact, that much of her secretiveness has to do with this need to conceal from the world something about her background. And she grew up in a boarding house on an unfashionable street in the shadow of a large, smoky cotton mill, which you see on the screen. But her youthful beauty and cleverness caught the attention of a Newburyport artist, Laura Hills, who became a sort of mentor. In about 1890, Ethel Reed and her mother moved to Boston, where she plunged into amateur theatricals, briefly enrolled in the Cowles Art School, did a few magazine illustrations, and then in February 1895, at the age of 21, suddenly captured the imagination of the public with a poster for the Boston Sunday Herald. This first poster proved to be typical of much of her subsequent work. The solitary figure is a young woman in a low-cut gown, very much a self-portrait, reading a newspaper. In the background is a row of enormous poppies, and we know that she was using opium, incidentally, by this time. The line at the bottom, ladies want it, is deliberately ambiguous, a characteristic little hidden joke. If you look at the poster on the right, which was for a novel done later in 1895, you will see that she is using the same formula, for essentially the same formula, though now the flowers have become larger and rather threatening and the woman's gown has morphed into a great billowing extension of her body. Oops, sorry. No doubt because of the chaotic circumstances of her final years, very few of Ethel Reed's preliminary designs and sketches have survived. But the National Museum of History, of American History, has several of them, one of which is shown here on the left. You will see that it displays all the usual hallmarks of her style. The glamorous woman, who again bears a suspicious resemblance to Ethel Reed herself, in an off-the-shoulder gown surrounded by huge, slightly menacing flowers. But of course, she was also capable of doing interesting variations on this pattern. In the poster and the illustrations for Gertrude Smith's children's book, the Arabella and Araminta stories, a copy of which from Mark Samuel Lasner's collection is over there, which is about a pair of twins who seem always to act and speak in unison. She is forced temporarily, temporarily out of the adult world, but Arabella and Araminta have the same striking hair and gowns and are depicted against the same surreal vegetation as Ethel Reed's grown-up women. Many of Ethel Reed's posters and book illustrations were done for the small publishing house of Copeland and Day, which was very sensitively attuned to the latest fashions in graphic design that were floating across the ocean from England and France. Fred Holland Day was an extremely odd and talented man an aesthete, 
a bibliophile, a photographer, and much else besides. In 1895, he took a series of revealing photographs of Ethel Reed, uh, the one of which you see on the right of the screen, all in strange costumes. Notice the leopard skin and the plant life springing from her head and showing a melancholy expression and a direct unsettling stare at the observer. These are red, rather edgy pictures and capture, I think, the darker side of her personality. At about this time, Ethel Reed entered into a relationship with Ralph Adams Cram, a rising young Boston architect who wrote a poem about her called The Night Moth that made a deep and lasting impression on her. Cram seems to have been dissuaded from marrying her by his mother, but he and Ethel continued to correspond regularly for several years, even after she fled to Europe. Cram's poem portrays himself as a moth making furtive nightly visits to a celandine, which belongs to the poppy family, let it be noted, and obviously represents Ethel. It is a remarkably passionate poem that offers an intriguing picture of their affair and contains hints of Ethel Reed's reputation in some Boston circles, at least, for easy sexual availability. I, uh, if, you, if you want all the prurient details, I quote the poem in its entirety in my book, page 23. <laughs> Thereafter, Ethel, in her letters to Ralph Cram, always addresses him as my dear moth, and her signature becomes a drawing of a drooping celadine frequently mounted by the moth, as, as here. In December, 1895, a Boston artist, Philip Leslie Hale, saw a self-portrait by Ethel Reed, the one that was showed in, shown in my very first slide, and is the one that's on the dust jacket of my book, and announced to friends that he had to meet her. By the following month, they were lovers and were engaged. On April 6, this is 1896, there was a reception at Laura Hill's studio on Boylston Street, very close to Ethel's own studio, which was reported in remarkable detail by Marion Depew, whose account appeared in newspapers across the continent. Yet within 24 hours after the reception, Ethel wrote to Francis Johnston in Washington, P.S. I ain't engaged anymore. <laughs> exactly what had happened is not clear. Nothing, I'm afraid, is ever clear in Ethel Reed's private life, <laughs> but I conjecture in my book that Philip Hale's overwhelmingly Brahmin family, uh, he was a son of Edward Everett Hale, no less, uh, brought pressure on Ethel to break off the engagement. Whatever happened, she saw herself as a tragic heroine who had been cruelly punished by the forces of bourgeois respectability. Ethel and Philip had intended to honeymoon in France. Instead, in May 1896, she sailed to Europe with her mother. They lived briefly in France and Germany, but by the end of the year they were in London, which was to be Ethel Reed's home for most of the rest of her life. One uncongenial task that had to be completed in France was the illustrations and poster for In Childhood's Company, a collection of children's stories by Louise Chandler Moulton. The author, whom Ethel rather disliked, insisted that the illustrations be done in the same style as those for Arabella and Araminta. But Ethel had her revenge by making the little girls in the pictures provocatively seductive, <laughs> sometimes portrayed nude and semi-nude. Their obvious sexual awareness troubled reviewers and Louise Chandler Moulton, who seems never to have spoken again to Ethel Reed. <laughs> and in another design by Ethel that year, an unfinished poster that appeared in a book, you, see that you can see the liberating effect that Europe was having on her erotic imagination. Her adult women are still characterized by billowing decollete dresses and exuberant flowers 
but in this case, there is a distinctly phallic looking snake slithering up her gown. In London, Ethel slipped easily and naturally into the group of writers who contributed to the Yellow Book. In America, she had been known as the leading disciple of Aubrey Beardsley, and now she was self-consciously following in his footsteps. From another point of view, her work in London continued to display an intense absorption with her inner life. In one of her Yellow Book contributions, for example, she portrays herself in a pensive, almost religious pose. The drawing is closely modeled after one of Francis Johnston's photographs that had been taken the previous year. In another yellow book illustration, entitled A Vision, the one that you see on the right, we seem to be moving into more alarming territory. Ethel, who is always proud of her long, beautiful tresses, displays herself in brutally cropped hair, staring at us in bleak horror with a field and cemetery rising in the background. I think we're very, very close to the territory of uh, Munch's The Scream at this point, and that's a, a work that Ethel probably was familiar with. As far as we know, Ethel Reed's last poster was for Richard Le Gallien's The Quest of the Golden Girl, over on the table, which was published in February 1897. Increasingly, Ethel liked to envision herself as a superbly beautiful woman who consoled and healed men with her sexual generosity. And it is not accidental that the women in her posters began to display both greater erotic power and saintly characteristics at the same time. By the time she had completed this poster, she and Le Gallien were lovers. It was a tempestuous relationship, but it endured even her prolonged residence in Ireland. One of Le Gallien's books, The Worshipper of the Image, published in 1900, <laughs> though it purports to be about the legend of a death mask of a beautiful young woman found in the Seine, is in fact a strange oblique record of his affair with Ethel. Le Gallien was married, and both he and Ethel seemed to have believed that his wife would accept Ethel as a spiritual third partner in the marriage. But Julie Le Gallien protested vigorously, and in March 1900, he broke off the liaison. Almost exactly nine months later, Ethel's first child, clearly Le Gallien's son, was born. I worked that one out, counting on my fingers. <laughs> In the summer of 1897, Ethel Reed and her mother suddenly decamped to an Irish village, Crosshaven, in County Cork. Was it because of financial problems or because Ethel Reed, the mother, Elizabeth Reed, the mother, wished to return to her homeland? Possibly, but the more likely explanation is that Ethel was on the verge of collapse. She had earlier begun taking opium and drinking heavily in Boston, and now she was unable to sleep and was starting to use a prescription sedative apparently every day. There were rising tensions between mother and daughter in this small Irish cottage who had never had a close relationship. Ethel took long walks, admired the sunsets, and fantasized about returning to London or Boston. By the fall of 1900, Ethel and her mother were back in London, and soon after the breakdown of the affair with Le Gallien, another man appeared in her life, Alexander Arnold Hannay, a wealthy, married, middle-aged solicitor who was a friend of Whistler's and spent his summers in Dieppe, mainly at the, apparently at the casino on the beach. Hannay's dirty little secret was that he was addicted to gambling, especially of the risky and illegal sort. Max Bierbaum wrote a short story called James Pethel about a reckless but charming Englishman who was clearly modeled on Hannay. And it doesn't require much ingenuity to, dis to discover the ghostly presence of Ethel Reed hovering on the edges of that story 
Even Pethel's name is meant to recall her. For the second time, Ethel was made pregnant by a married man who then abandoned her and returned to his wife. In December 1901, she gave birth to Hannah's daughter, who was named Alexandra in the birth certificate. Later, Ethel was forced to retreat from this fearless proclamation of her daughter's paternity by changing the first name to Elizabeth, but Alexandra remained half-heartedly concealed as her middle name. From this point onward, the story of Ethel Reed's life becomes admittedly more obscure, and I had to struggle to break through the silence. In the end, however, I was able to reconstruct at least an outline of her final years, mainly through the pursuit of various legal documents. I found, for example, that in 1903, she married a wealthy English army officer, Arthur Sale Whiteley. Though my investigations were temporarily hampered by the fact that he shortly thereafter changed his surname to Warwick. It's very annoying when people change their names. <laughs> In any event, as I have learned later from other sources, the marriage broke up on the honeymoon, no less, in Menton. <laughs> Ethel returned to, to England, tried unsuccessfully to re relaunch her career as an artist, and struggled to support herself and her two children on a small stipend from Warwick. In 1909, she brought suit against him for uh, as it was rather quaintly phrased, restoration of conjugal rights, as the court documents phrased it. But in fact, those records make it clear that what she really wanted was greater financial support. She failed in this attempt. In her final year, she was living in a boarding house, just as she had during childhood, with her son and daughter, sustained only by the charity of her landlady and dwindling contributions from Arthur Warwick. There is also some evidence to suggest that her eyesight was failing. Ethel Reed slowly sank more deeply into alcoholism and drug addiction. On the 1st of March, 1912, one day after her wedding anniversary, she died in Hammersmith on the western edge of London of an overdose a cocktail of whiskey and her favorite sleeping tablet. The coroner's jury, jury decided that it was an accidental death. Misadventure is the word that appears on the certificate. But the evidence is ambiguous, and I am very much aware of what the coroner could not have known, the distinctly suicidal tone of her letters for many years before. In death, she achieved the mysterious invisibility that she sometimes seemed to be seeking during her lifetime, except for a report of the inquest in a local London newspaper. I have been unable to find any notice of her passing in either England or America. In the preface to my book, I offered this summing up of the story. I do not claim to have solved all the mysteries of Ethel Reed's strange journey. She was a woman of many secrets to which she frequently alludes in her letters. And her life at times resembles a dance of the seven veils. Her disappearance from public view at the end of the 19th century was merely her final and climactic secret. She knew that she had baffled her old friends and admirers and the public at large and when she fled to Europe in 1896, she seemed to find pleasure, at least temporarily, in recovering her privacy and searching for a new identity in London. We sense that she enjoys mystifying us. It is a part of her allure. I hope I have not diminished her allure, allure today by revealing some of her secrets. <laughs> Um, questions from the audience? Bill, is anything done with your children? I spent a great deal of time, Paul, in pursuit of the children. 
And uh, the short answer is no. I have a couple of leads which I would like to pursue at some point in the future. Um, she, she named Hannah as the uh, guardian of her children in her will. But they are not mentioned in his will. I find no evidence of them in anywhere in his life in later years. Um, I just don't know. There's another hand over here. Yes. Sorry, I don't see the hand. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier something about a yellow paper or a yellow book, and I'm not familiar with that thing that she participated in. Yeah, that was a, 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 a rather celebrated avant-garde literary and artistic magazine published in London by, uh, by John Lane. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the chief figure associated with it was uh, Aubrey Beardsley. And Beardsley had, was no longer connected with the Yellow Book by the time she arrived in London. Uh, and I can't quite make out whether she ever met Beardsley. I think it's theoretically possible that she could have but I found no evidence of it. But there are just so many mysteries in her life. I can't, I can't describe to you all the things I don't know about <laughs> Ethel Reed that I would like to know. Yes? Uh, but she seems to have evolved very quickly as a fabulous artist. Mm -hmm. Is this due to the influence of that one woman? Or was there an art school? Were there other people? I mean, how did... I don't think it was the art school that did it. Um, I don't know. I, that, that's a very interesting question, and uh, uh, I don't have a, a, a quick and glib answer for it, I'm afraid. She, she, she always described herself as self-taught, and she said she did everything by instinct. And I think, that in fact, that was part of her problem when she went to London, that she was trying to remake herself as an artist, and she had really not a great deal to fall back upon except her instincts. Uh, so, who knows? Yeah. Any chance that she knew Althea Giles or Giles, another artist of the period, the same period with a kind of a similar brief? Uh, where, where, where was she living in? Sorry. London. In London. Um, I don't know because Ethel Reed's letters are very rarely about the people that she must have known and met a lot of interesting people. She lived right around the corner from Whistler, for example, uh, when she was living in Chelsea. Um, her letters are intensely, if I may use an unflattering word, narcissistic. I mean, she, she, they're about herself and about her feelings and what's going on inside her, and uh, she very rarely mentions other people. So I don't recall ever seeing that name, but that doesn't mean anything. Her connection to Frederick Benjamin Austin, do you, do you have any background on that? Well, she came down to Washington in January 1896 because Johnston had helped to organize uh, a, a poster exhibition, uh, which was not entirely devoted to Ethel Reed's work, but largely, I would say. And it got rather heavy coverage in the Post and other newspapers. And when she came down here, then she was photographed by her. They kept in touch, uh, and uh, Frances Johnston then supplied her, or let me put it the other way around, Ethel Reed ordered copies of those photographs and distributed them to magazines around the country. Is that not the, is that not the yes. photograph we have on the table? Is that These first? are three photographs by Francis Benjamin Johnston. Yes. yes. And then a, the blue photo is a portrait of Miss Johnston right at the same time period with her um, studio in her parents' house decorated with book and magazine posters on mm -hmm. the wall. Mm -hmm. So you can see the photographer and the subject. And uh, they kept in touch Incidentally, after that, I, I, th there is some very slight evidence that, that Frances Johnston may have visited her in Ireland. And then I found an interesting letter of hers uh, a few years later. Uh, I don't remember the exact date. I think it was probably around 1905, after which, by which time everybody in, in America had lost touch with, with uh, Ethel Reed. And she, uh, she was writing, writing, I think, to uh, Fred Holland Day, as I recall, 
uh, asking him if she had an if he had an address for uh, Ethel Reed in London. He wanted to look her up, but then I looked in uh, Johnston's diary, travel diary, for that summer in London, and I found no reference to to her. So I don't think she found her. Yes. Any chance that she used the pictorial as photographer Francis Benjamin? I'm mean, sorry, uh, Zaida Ben Yusuf, who was from London, moved in those same circles in New York, and then went back to London about the same time as Ethel Reed. Again, anything is possible. I don't know. I, 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 all I can tell you is that the name doesn't appear in in the correspondence. With a name like that, you would. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure I would have. Yes. Well, there are several groups of her letters. The most important group um, is the letters from Ethel Reed to um, Ralph Adams Cram. Uh, those are in Massachusetts, but the, I found a microfilm set of them at the uh, Archives of American Art. Um, and uh, that's tr they're tremendously revealing. They're, they're the, it's the only full epistolary re record of any of her love affairs. Uh, and it's, they're, they're quite remarkable letters. They deserve to be published in their entirety. Um, they're, the letters to um, Philip Hale are, are also at the uh, Archives of American Art. Um, the 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 uh, let's see. Then there are, there are some letters to uh, Copeland and Day, um, and there are a few scattered letters around. But uh, you have to dig. Frankly, it's it's hard to find. There may be other big caches of letters that I don't know about that may turn up eventually. I'm hoping that my blog will have the effect of sort of bringing new information to light because I feel, I, I, when I was writing this book, I felt that I, you know, I couldn't make it the project for the rest of my life. I had to bring it to an end. I uh, had to uh, send it to a publisher at some point and send it out into the world. Uh, but um, uh, it was clear to me that there are a lot of unanswered questions. One more question, maybe? Yes, she was the the uh, in well, she was drinking rather heavily in in the '90s in 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 Boston, the mid '90s in Boston. Um, I think her mother was a rather weak personality; didn't exercise too much supervision over her. Uh, she was drinking very heavily early on. Uh, she was doing opium quite early on, and um, uh, she clearly. I don't like to fling around these terms too loosely, but she clearly was suffering from depression. And the one thing that runs through her letters all her life is that she has great difficulty sleeping. So she was taking various kinds of sedatives and sleeping tablets, uh, and that's what happened to her at the end. She was using a prescription sleeping tablet that she had been using for quite a few years called sulfonol. I, I know nothing about it. I don't think it's used or prescribed nowadays, but it seems to have been rather potent stuff. Uh, when she was in Ireland, she had a doctor coming every day to, her, to, her, uh, uh, to the, the cottage where she and her mother were living uh, with, with, with drugs. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's, it sounds all sort of painfully familiar, yes. Do you want to jump in before we close? Well, I just wanted to ask, did you say she had siblings or no? No, no siblings. Was she married? No, no siblings. Um, two children, um, both born out of wedlock, um, and uh, that's it. So, um, as a reminder, if you didn't get a flyer, Bill has some for his book over in the corner in the back are the two items that Mark Samuels Lasner very kindly brought. And on the table, we have uh, some of the posters and one of the books, posters from Princeton Photographs. As I always say, 
uh, someone will be happy to show you what you'd like to look at. Please, <laughs> too many people for you to be picking things up. Um, maybe the people from Print and Photograph, since they know their materials better, might be able to hover and help explain some of them. Uh, and before we do that, let's thank Bill for a great talk. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.